you to open up with me to the book of Matthew chapter one. Our kids have already kind of read through that story, but I want to pick it up here as we talk about really the hope that Jesus brings to us today. Not just the hope that came 2,000 years ago, but the hope that we can have here today. And so just to remind us of the story of Christmas, Luke chapter two and Matthew chapter one is where we read the accounts. Luke chapter two is probably more that extensive account there where we see Jesus in the manger. But Matthew Matthew chapter one, let's pick it up here. We're reading here several verses, starting in verse 18. It says this, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in dreams, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name. Everybody say it with me, what? She'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet saying, verse 23, and this is a quote from the book of Isaiah chapter seven. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, and everybody else say it with me, which is translated God with us. God with us. With us, And let me just kind of address this for just a moment. I don't know if you picked up maybe what some people might call a discrepancy in that scriptures that we just read, because we see the angel appear there to Joseph. And in that moment, you know, because just to you, for you to understand, here's Mary, she's pregnant, but yet she is unmarried. Now, in our culture today, it is still something that is looked on to deal with, but in that time and age, a woman could literally be stoned to death because of what Mary had experienced, somebody that was pregnant out of wedlock. So Joseph says, being a just man, you know, he was trying to figure out how to get out of this commitment that he'd made to marry Mary. But the angel of the Lord showed up and says, no, what's inside of her is birth because of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I want you to know today the Holy Spirit is still very much alive and well, amen? And I believe that he's birthing some things in some of y'all here today. But there, the angels told Joseph, you're gonna call his name what? No, he said, you're gonna call him Jesus. His name shall be Jesus. But later on, according to the prophet Isaiah, it says that his name shall be called Emmanuel. Well, wait a minute. Is it Jesus or is it Emmanuel? I really believe that as the Isaiah the prophet was speaking prophetically about Jesus and that it would be Emmanuel, Emmanuel was really more to describe the character and the nature, kind of like a nickname. I'm kind of curious here today. Does anybody have a nickname? Or you got somebody in your life that with a nickname? Anybody got nicknames? Somebody yell me out one of the nicknames that you're known by or that you got somebody in your family. What is the nicknames? Cowboy. Cowboy. It's what? High pockets? High pockets. Now, I'm really curious to know why it's high. Cowboy. I mean, you know, my son-in-law, Kinsley, who's up here on the stage, you know, um, he, you know he's a pilot with the, mili- with the Air Force. And uh, many times we'd get Air Force people in the church, you know, and I'd talk to him, greet him after church. And, hey, do you know my son-in-law out at the Air Force base? You know, his, what's his name? They'd say, well, it's Kinsley Jordan. they say, I don't know a Kinsley Jordan. And, and they said, now, there's a guy out there named Trigger, Trigger Jordan, is that could be, oh yeah, that's Trigger. You know, he's got a nickname out there. Every Air Force pilot has a nickname or a call name that, and there's a whole story behind why they are called that. I won't tell you how Kinsley got his name Trigger. You can ask him yourself, but you know, a nickname. And it just kind of describes the character, High Pockets. I'm really curious to know about High Pockets here. That's so tall, okay, the high pockets, you know. But it really describes a character. It describes, you know, uh, 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 what they do. And so we see here that the prophet said his name shall be known as Emmanuel, but Emmanuel translated as what? God with us. God with us. Now, for every one of us that's sitting in the sanctuary right now that it's, and that's online right now, that phrase, God with us, probably has some meaning to us, but it really probably doesn't have the magnitude of the meaning that it did with those people at the time. Because at that time, 
The people of God, God's chosen people, they had been living, you know, for 700 years off this prophecy of Isaiah that the Messiah would come. 700 years, they'd been under Roman occupation for going on 60 years. It was a dark time. And besides all that, they hadn't heard a new word from God for 400 years. Now, if there was ever a time that God seemed distant, it was then. And for this event to take place, God is with us. How significant was that? So significant. See, so let's talk about this for just a moment. Talking about the birth of Jesus is prophesied. It comes about here. And, and we know that Jesus came for God so loved the world that what happened? That he gave his only son. That whoever would believe, up, uh, believe upon him. How many of y'all believe upon Jesus today? Let me hear you today. Whoever would believe upon him would have What? everlasting life. So Jesus, yes, he did come to save us from our sins, but I also believe that there is another reason that he came that many times that we don't talk about. We know that Jesus came, we're celebrating the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem there in the manger, but we do know that he lived for 33 years before he went to the cross of Calvary. We're just a few months away from celebrating the death of Jesus and not just the death, but the burial, not just the burial, but the resurrection of Jesus. The benefits of that, when Easter comes around the last of March, just a few, months, a few weeks away, start marking your calendar, right? But think about this for just a moment. Why did Jesus come? The mission that Jesus came to the earth, why did he come? Yes, he came to pay the price for our sins, but if he came to pay the price for our sins, why not did he do it as a teenager? Why didn't he do it when he hit 21? Why for 33 years that he lived his life? I believe, church, that Emmanuel, God with us, that one of the reasons why it took him 33 years to fulfill that mission was this, that he came to experience life. He came to experience life. In fact, in theology, this is called the theology of identification. This means that Jesus didn't just come to save us, but he came to experience enough life to know what we would go through. See, what was Jesus doing from birth to 30 when he started his ministry? You know what he was doing? He was living life. He was a kid. He was a teenager. He was a young adult. He was working with his dad in the carpentry shop. He was probably having to deal with business and, you know, people not paying their bills. He, was a, he, he experienced life. In fact, look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 with me right quick here. Hebrews 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize. Everybody say sympathize. Who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Come on, anybody have some, just some lack or some areas of your life? You're just feeling something that you just maybe... Man, I need some help in this area. This is what he's talking about. He says, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Look at verse 16. Let us then therefore come, everybody say it with me, boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I want you to know today that God is a relational God. And when Jesus came to this earth, he didn't come as some formal figure. He came as a man. He laid down his deity. He lived the life that we are living. And because of that, we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, what is your perspective of God today? What is your perspective of Jesus today? What is your perspective of the authority that God brings to our life today? See, some people look at God as that wizard in the Wizard of Oz. Oh, what do you want? You know, go give me this. This, ah. Come on, God, that's not God. Come on, God is a personal God. And we can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ here today. See, if you don't have the right picture of God, you won't have a right relationship with him. The way you view him is the way that you will know him. Amen. So the Christmas story is about the gift of hope that Jesus is to the world. Before I leave Hebrews chapter four, let me read it to you out of the Message Bible. Look at the screen. It says, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing. Look at this. He's experienced it all. All but <laughs> the sin, right? Verse 16, look at, look at this. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's ready to give. Take the mercy Accept the help. Wow. I remember here a couple years ago, I got invited to a, a breakfast at the governor's mansion. 
And so I remember walking into the governor's mansion there. I thought it was going to be this great big old group of people, but I walked in and there was only 10 other pastors there, the governor stit there in Oklahoma City. Now, when I walked in there to the governor's mansion, man, I was like this, this respect. I didn't walk into the governor's mansion and say, hey, Kevin, what's up? I'm going to give him a high five and a big old hug, man. I treated it very formal. But I tell you what, there's some of y'all, when y'all come to the room, I mean, we're in relationship and I don't treat you in a formal relationship. I'm like, hey, what's up? And we hug, come on. We give the fist bumps, we give the bro hug, man. And woo, yeah, come on now, come on. And you know what I'm talking about? What's the difference? It's all about relationship. It's about relationship. But I want you to know that God is a relational God. Anybody with me here today? And in a relational God, the relation, why he so much, he, he knows us because he empathizes with us. You know, have you ever noticed that it's easier to empathize with someone if you've been through the same thing? I've, I, you know, I'm old enough now. I'm 56 years of age. How many of y'all know that's not very old? Thank you for that one amen right over there, that encouragement. You're making me feel real good today. But you know, I've experienced some life. I, and, and it's kind of funny because I was with my oldest son. My oldest son, he's a twin to Brooke up here. Brooke and Kinsley, you know Brooke and Kinsley? They're twins. She's got a twin brother, Brandon. Many of y'all don't, haven't met Brandon yet. But he's 32 years of age. And he's, we had to make a trip to Lowe's. He's talking to me. And I, he's talking to me about the church. And I started the church. And I came to this epiphany. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're 32. I was 30 years old when we started the World Harvest Church. And I was like thinking to my son, I was 30 years old. Anybody 30 years old? I'm like, holy cow, I was 30 years old. Tammy was, what, 28? I can't believe anybody came to World Harvest Church back in that day for a 30-year-old preacher. <laughs> but I've experienced some life. I knew a lot of theory of the scriptures. You know, up until two years ago, I'd never had someone close to me die. But as a matter of a year, Tammy lost her father and I lost my father in the same year. Let me tell you, my experience with people going through death now is totally different. I don't want to say totally, is, is different than it used to be because I now really empathize with people a little bit more. My year of 2008, the hell that I went through in 2008, our world falling apart in 2008, guess what? I've got a different perspective that somebody else is going through the same thing. I've got some empathy. I want you to know today that Jesus knows what you are going through today. If you're going through something, Jesus knows. So here's the simple message of hope we have today for Christmas. It's this. The one sitting on the throne became a human being. Look at this. And he experienced everything. Come on, everybody say everything. He experienced everything you and I would experience. And look at this. He, say those last two words with me. He understood. Understands. He understands. Let me give you three quick things that he understands. Number one is this. Jesus, he understands relationships. He understands relationships. If you're going through a difficult relationship, Jesus understands that. Come on, anybody has somebody that you're in relationship with? Anybody got a crazy person in your family? Come on, anybody? Listen, everybody's got somebody crazy in their family. I want you to know that. And, and, and let me just say this, if you don't have somebody crazy in your family, it could be you, <laughs> all right? I want you to look at something here. Jesus, see, sometimes we have this concept of Jesus. Jesus, he was, he was the Lamb of God. He came, he was born. He was loved by everybody. He had this perfect life. I mean, when he walked into the room, his brothers and sisters worshiped him and his mom and dad was, what do you need today? Can I bring you breakfast in bed? Uh-uh. Let me show you some scriptures here. Let's look at Matthew chapter six, and I'll just throw them up on the screen real quickly. Cool this Matthew chapter six, verse thirty-three. I want you to see. I want you to see Jesus's family dynamic. It says this: Is this not the carpenter? This is when Jesus came to his hometown of Nazareth to minister. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James? Look at this: of Joseph, of Judas, and Simon. Who are those four people? Those are Jesus's brothers, right? And are not his Sis, what's that S on the end mean? His sisters? His sisters, in other words, there was at least more than one, right? Are they not all the with us? Look at this. And so they were offended at him. So we know that Jesus had a minimum of six siblings in his household. Now, those of you that got more than one child in your household, how calm and peaceful is a home full of kids? So we know he had at least six siblings, right? 
So with Jesus, minimum in his household was seven kids. Now, how peaceful do you think that home was? I don't know. I dare to say there was probably some sibling disputes. Anybody with me here today? Come on, I dare to say there was probably that moment that Simon said, Mama, Mama, Jesus is picking on me. It could happen. Could have happened. Think about this. Jesus growing up at home with six, a minimum of six siblings, seven kids in the home. Joseph working probably all day and Mary trying to put it all together. Now you also got to remember during that time, scholars tell us that Mary was probably whenever she conceived Jesus, she could have been as young as 12 and maybe as old as 16 max in that period of time, okay? So could you imagine, let's say Mary's 20 years old, 22 years old with seven kids, holy cow. Jesus knows relationships. Well, pastor, they treated him wonderfully. Look at Matthew chapter, Mark chapter three real quick. Let me throw this scripture up here. This is Mark chapter three, verse 21, New Living Translation. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Let's see this, what happens? When his family heard what was happening, just kind of disturbed Jesus in the ministry, just kind of give you the backstory to that. They tried to take him away. This was his family's response. He's out of his mind, they said. Jesus, his family, didn't even believe in him. I think the only person that believed in Jesus maybe was his mother Mary and his dad Joseph, his brothers and sisters. Jesus knows dysfunction in relationships. I believe it, right? You don't believe me? Let's look at another one here. John chapter seven, verse five. John seven, five. For even his brothers, this isn't John seven, even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read these passages of scripture, Holy cow, it gives me a new understanding. Jesus knows my relationships. Jesus has been through some stuff. Jesus has been through some people not believing in him. His blood relatives didn't even believe in him. His brothers and sisters didn't even believe. He was rejected by his own kin, his own blood. Jesus knows relationships. He, I, I believe that Jesus knows what it's like to be single, right? We've seen the scripture, he never married. But I also believe that he knows what it's like to be married. You say, What? Yeah, because the Bible tells us that he is the bridegroom and we, the church, we are the bride, right? Jesus knows what it's like to have a spouse, a wife cheat on him. You say, how do you know that? Because every one of us have disappointed God. Every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Come on, every one of us, if we're the bride of Christ, come on, how many of y'all know we're imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God, we make mistakes. He knows our pain. I want you to know that he knows the struggle. He knows what it's like to be in relationships. He knows that dynamic. So here's my question to us here today. When are you gonna to talk to him about your relationship problems that you're having? He knows the problems. He's just saying, will you talk to me about it? So he knows relationships. Number two, he understands life. Jesus, number two, he understands life. Now you think about this for just a moment. Jesus was prepared. Actually, he could have started his ministry at 12 years of age. Because we have this brief glimpse of Jesus there. You know, not much is known. We know about the, you know, the birth. We're celebrating. We know about the, you know, uh, the, the wise men coming. Um, so we have this period of about from birth to about two years of age that we read about. You know, uh, if, if you see the nativity scenes there with the wise men around the nativity scene there, you know, that's not necessarily Bible, okay? Because it says that the, the wise men showed up later. He was, he was a child, not a baby, uh, and scholars believe he was probably around, you know, two years of age when the wise men showed up. So we, we got this glimpse, nothing about Jesus until 12 years of age. Whenever mom and dad, they traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the, the Passover. They leave, they're gone, going back home for two days and they realize, oh, we forgot something. They left Jesus in Jerusalem. They forgot Jesus. I mean, how do you do that? Well, it makes more sense if you got at least six other people you're trying to keep corralled, right? Makes a little more sense of that story. So they go back and Jesus is in the temple, not listening to the scholars, but he's teaching the scholars. And he's teaching them in such a profound way that even the, the priests, they're like, man, this kid's got it. He could have started ministry at 12 years of age, but yet we go into the silence, this 18 years of silence from 12 to 30 before Jesus starts the ministry. What was going on? Let me tell you what's going on. Life was going on for Jesus. I can guarantee you. Look at Hebrews chapter two right quick. Let me just throw it on the screen for you. Verse 17 out of the NIV says this. It says, for this reason, he had to, he had to be made like them. Talking about Jesus. He had to, be, had to be made like them. 
fully human in every way. Look at this. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus, he experienced what we are experiencing today. Look at the message translation. He says that's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself. All the pain, all the testing, and he would be able to help where help was needed. I don't know about you, but man, this stirs my hope up. This stirs me up here today because you know what the Bible tells us the, where Jesus is at today? Now, I don't mean to just get real technical, but you know, a lot of times we ask kids, where's Jesus at? And they say, he's in our heart. You know, yeah, woohoo. Jesus really and technically in your heart. Come on, it's the presence of Jesus, the Holy Spirit that's in us. Jesus physically is at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing today? Anybody remember what the scriptures tell us? It says that he's making what? Intercession for us. He's our high priest. He's making intercession for you and I. So when I go to Jesus with my problem, I'm not, again, I'm kind of getting technical. I'm not necessarily praying to God. You know who I'm praying to? I'm praying to Jesus. And Jesus is my advocate. He's my helper. He's the one, when I pray to him, Lord Jesus, I need some help right now. I've got this situation. I, I've got this thing going bad right now. Jesus, can you help me? And Jesus says, I hear you. Let me go to Father. Father, man, Brad needs this situation. And I remember what it was like. I remember, dude, I, you know, the, maybe the circumstances are just a little bit, but I remember that situation. God, we need to help him. This is what the Bible's telling us. He empathizes with us. He knows our life. Man. I don't know about you, but this gets me excited, amen? He experienced life like we're experiencing him. So here's my question to this point. When are you gonna to talk to him about your life? When are you gonna spend some time with Jesus? Amen? Let's look at the third thing that he understands here. Number three is this, Jesus understands pain. He understands pain. Anybody experienced any pain before? Now, we know according to scripture that Jesus, he was fully human, right? In his human experience, he experienced physical pain. Yes, we know that. In fact, look at he, Isaiah. Look at the, what, uh, another passage in Isaiah chapter 53. I quote this many times when we're in our communion Sunday. He experienced pain. It says this, New Living Translation, verse three. He was despised and he was, everybody help me out, what? So he didn't experience just physical pain. He experienced relational pain. He experienced emotional pain. Come on, if you've ever been rejected by people before, it's not just physical, it's what? It's mental. He experienced physical, he experienced emotional. He experienced every kind of pain known to mankind. It goes on and says he was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest. What? Grief, grief. What is grief? Grief it is emotion that is triggered by a loss, by something missing. It says we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Jump down to verse five. Verse five says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. Y'all know the story of Jesus where they pierced his side with the sword, sudden blood and water poured out of him. He was crushed for our sins. Now, those of you that's ever experienced sin, which is all of us, how many of you know there is a weight to sin? Come on, there's a heaviness to sin. If you ever messed up, there's a heaviness, there's a weightiness to that. Think about this. Jesus, he didn't just take one sin upon him on the cross. He took all the sins of the entire world. Could you imagine how crushing that probably felt? He was crushed. He was beaten so that we could be whole. Y'all see that word there? He was beaten so that we could be made what? Whole. Come on, everybody say whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away, but we have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid upon him all the sins of us all. He was oppressed. He was treated harshly. Yet, what does that happen? What happened? He never, come on, say it with me. He what? 
Do you think he knows what it's like to be ridiculed? Do you think he, he knows what it's like to be made fun of? Do you think he knows what it's like for people to criticize him? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Let me tell you, Jesus knows pain. He knows pain. He knows grief. Let me speak to this for just a moment as I wrap this message up. When Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary, the Bible tells us that he looked down and he saw his mother. And he said, mother, behold your son. He didn't stop there. He looked over to John, the disciple. And he said, John, behold your mother. In other words, what took place in that moment of time when Jesus was dying was this. He realized that Mary was gonna be left on her own. So he assigned John to take care of Mary. Now listen to me. That would have been totally inappropriate if his dad Joseph was still alive. Most scholars agree because of the statement that Jesus made on the cross that Jesus' father had passed away at some point in time. Now, if you're a Chosen fan, the series like Tammy and I, season three, there's a beautiful moment in one of those episodes. I think it's either episode one or episode two of season three where Jesus goes back home and he has a moment at his father's grave. It's very moving. But Jesus, he experienced everything we have. I still remember, I mean, it's, I'm going, two years ago, two years ago, almost to the day, my dad lay dying of COVID in the ICU on full life support. And it's, you know, he, on, it's on January the 1st that he passed away. A great man of God leading a great church, a man who taught faith all of his life, a man who never had any issues health-wise in his life. I mean, if there was anybody that in the natural deserved to live through COVID, it was my dad. He didn't make it. He died. The grief that we experienced, let me tell you, Jesus experienced the same. Those of you that have lost loved ones, I want you to know, you can go to Jesus to talk to him about life he experienced it. He knows it. He knows the pain. I want you to stand your feet with me here. So what's our instructions today? What are you going to do with this here today? First of all, I want, I want you to know today that this is why we can have hope. Because God's not distant because of what Jesus did for us. He's very relational. He's very there for us. He's there in the moment of time. <laughs> And I believe there's sometimes we just go through something in our life and we feel like we're so isolated that nobody knows our pain and sorrow. But Jesus is saying like, yeah, I remember that. I experienced that. <laughs> and we allow those moments to separate us from God's love because we don't think that God understands. We don't think that Jesus understands. I've got this statement in my notes here. Jesus isn't just merciful because he's a great God. He's merciful because he experienced life. And he knows what we're going through. So in the words of James chapter four, verse eight says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Would you bow your heads with me here today? Dear Heavenly Father, this is just the message you stirred in my heart for us to just to hear together. Lord, as I was preparing this message and even as I've delivered here this morning, Lord, there's a stirring of hope in my life right now. Lord, as I prepared this, there were some things that I saw in the scriptures that I, I didn't really realize was there. I didn't realize the magnitude of the life that you'd experienced. So Lord, I pray that the same revelation knowledge has come to each and every one of us that's hearing this message today. Jesus, you know our sorrows, you know our pains, you know what we go through, you know our relationships. You know it all. You know life. Lord, I just take courage in that. And I draw close to you here today because I know I'm in a safe place (laughs) because you know where I've been and you know what I'm going through. Thank you for your goodness. 
Lord, I pray that through this today that hope has been stirred, hope has arisen. Our life is safe in you. We're hopeful today. We're hopeful today. Prayer team, if you'd come at this time. Listen, before you leave today, I just want you to ask yourself this question. First of all, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? 